Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Mike McMahon. I'm the executive director of the Hymn Society in the United States and Canada, and it's a real joy today for me to uh, have an opportunity to have a conversation with Mark Miller. Um, many of you, I'm sure, know Mark primarily through the works that he's created for us to sing, and which are just so wonderful and so beautifully expressive of the lyrics that go with them. Uh, Mark is currently professor of church music, director of chapel and composer in residence at uh, Drew University in Madison, New Jersey. And he's also a uh, minister of music at Christ Church, which is a congregation of both the United Church of Christ and the American Baptist Convention uh, in Summit, New Jersey. He's also a lecturer in sacred music at, at the Yale Institute of Sacred Music and Divinity School, uh, where he co-teaches an organ chorus and directs the gospel choir. Well, I don't know how he has time to do anything else uh, with all of that, but he continues to to put out really wonderful work for, for us to sing and, and has had a great influence on uh, congregational singing in the churches in, 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 in North America. So, Mark, thanks for being with us today. It's great to, to be with you. Thank you, Mike. It's great to be here. Great. Well, I, I was wondering if we could just start out by learning a little bit about you and uh, how you came to be interested in, in music and also um, how you came to be interested in serving the church through music, uh, any early experiences you might have had. Sure. Well, uh, my upbringing probably has a lot of resonances with a lot of uh, other musicians who might be listening, but it also has some differences. I, I was, I was born in Burlington, Vermont. And seven days later, I only lived up there in the cold state for seven days and then was flown down on a cold night in January to my adopted parents, my adopted family, where uh, in New Jersey, where I've lived my almost whole life besides going to school in New York and Connecticut. But uh, the family I was adopted into uh, had, uh, I grew up with, there were seven siblings and five of us were adopted. And my parents uh, who were white had, my oldest brother and sister were white and a younger sister who is black or biracial like myself and uh, two brothers and sister who are Korean American. So uh, growing up was a kind of a special experience where I experienced, um, I guess I could say kind of unconditional love from my parents. They, they treated me like I was their child and they were my parents. And, uh, and from the earliest times, I remember going to church. Uh, my father is a United Methodist pastor, as was his father, uh, who was a local pastor in the Methodist church, as is my oldest sister, who's now retired clergy Methodist pastor, as is her daughter, my niece, who's <laughs> Methodist clergy, as is my cousin, who's United <laughs> Methodist clergy. Wow. So, uh, it's kind of a wild uh, United Methodist um, oligarchy. Uh, I, I escaped uh, being ordained, uh, but <laughs> uh, being a lay person uh, in the church has been super fulfilling and uh, what I feel is my calling. But I, I do remember uh, vaguely in the back of my mind, I was maybe four years old as uh, running down the aisle of our little white church, uh, white clapboard church organ play the postlude um just hear the pipes like kind of shaking my whole body just the vibration in the room was was really thrilling to me and um and i never quite got over that i have just been in love with the pipe organ ever since and um uh, maybe because of hearing the instrument and hearing it played uh even though i don't say i think i heard it played well for the first uh, 10 or 12 years of my life. Uh, I, I, I can't really say with any, um, with any certainty I heard uh, like stirring congregational music in the church. Uh, but the organ stirred me, but the place I did hear music that really stirred my heart was at Methodist music camp when I was a 10 or 12 year old and, and early teenager, uh, being in being in the camp, uh, he, being in the middle of the woods, having my dad nearby because he was one of the he was the director of the Methodist camp in New Jersey at the time, 
and uh, singing songs like uh, they'll know we're Christians by our love or um, the love round. So it's interesting in these minor keys, these minor modalities that really grabbed my imagination and my, my spiritual imagination of being in the woods, experiencing uh, communion from very simple elements, uh, being with surrounded by friends and family. Uh, that was my experience of God. That, that was really kind of all brought it together in important ways for me. Uh, so my camp experience, uh, then going to, to music camp uh, with the Methodists early on really brought it home to me. The joy of learning a children's musical alongside of Randall Thompson's Alleluia Um at at uh, Krista Grant's music camp in the 1970s and 80s, and that 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 set me on my path of knowing that when people gather to sing together, um, the fun, the playfulness, the joy, the power, the tears, the laughter, the spirit uh, that God is there that that did it for me, um, as well as you know um, organ lessons and piano lessons that started. When I was in first, second, third grade and um, started taking organ lessons when I was in high school, when I became the organist of our church in high school. Um, then I then I realized that the organ is, for me, the way uh, that I can help lead the congregation in singing. Um, yeah, so go ahead, ask me. I was going to say, so I, I just... It really struck me when you said you became the organist at your church when you were in high school. Um, that, that that's pretty young to become. You were like the you know I mean the main organist. Yes, I was the main organist. Um, in fact, I I spoke to one of the adults in the choir recently, maybe a few years ago, and I said, you know, what were you all thinking uh, hiring me as a fifteen year old? And she said, well. Some people were like, yeah, why are we hiring this 15 year old? And um, despite that, I was the the pastor's son. They they said, you know, let's give him a chance. And I mean, I, I played fairly well. I, I I didn't play really well until I think I was getting ready to graduate from high school. But I had a passion and they saw that and they nurtured it. And um, it's good for me to remember now that. You know, if we don't give young people the chance, sometimes they can't be nurtured and grow into where they're supposed to be. Um, so I'm deeply, deeply grateful for that Methodist church to give me the the opportunity. Um, and 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 I also was the envy of most of my friends in high school who had to work really hard throughout the week. And of course, I was I didn't consider practicing hard, so I'd spend hours a day rehearsing, but then I'd work on Sunday morning or choir rehearsal Thursday night. And they'd be like, how do you make all this money being an organ? You know, <laughs> so, so, well, this is, this is what you get when you practice, you know, so. There are too many organists that can say, well, I make a lot of money playing the organ. <laughs> yeah. As a high school student. Yeah. yeah making that, you know, a hundred dollars a week or whatever it was. That was, that was big time. So, that is really cool. So you also uh, were in charge, you were like, like the music director as well, I guess. I was not the music director. Oh. I, I, there was a choir director, and she would choose uh, Jan Miles, graduate of Westminster Choir College. She would, she would choose the anthems. And um, so it, it was interesting, though, for most church musicians, uh, for me included, I learned by apprenticeship. I Because when I went away to college, you know, I, I studied music, but organ performance was really my thing. I didn't really study choral, chorally myself, but then right after college, my first job uh, while I was in grad school was the music, the choir director and organist. And uh, so I had to rely a lot back on my high school years and what that choir director kind of helped me with um, in learning repertoire for choirs, you know. Yeah, I was just thinking what an effective way to to learn uh, was because you had sort of your own thing as the organist, but also, you know, the mentorship of someone who was experienced in church music at the same time. That's really, really amazing. So so you did go off to college to study uh, music. I did. I did. Um, my organ teachers, uh, Robert Baker, 
who is a name uh, well known to church musicians uh, because the because of him being the dean of the, the School of Music at Union Theological Seminary in the 60s. Um, he's also somewhat uh, controversially known because he moved the School of Music from Union to Yale uh, in 1973. And, uh, but in 1985 was my organ teacher and he really took me under his wing and became my grandfather to me. And uh, I, I can't, I, I can't say enough about how he got me on my, um, got me on my way with my, with my career. Uh, when, I, when I was leaving Yale, he said, okay, you're going to go, study organ. He tried to talk me out of being a church musician for, <laughs> for a good two years. He said, you know, why do you want to do this? And I'd say, well, I, you know, I love playing. And he's like, that's not good enough. You think, you know, what are you, what are you really thinking about in terms of making a living? Like he was really understanding that, you know, it, you can choose a vocation, but you also have to you know to support yourself. And I convinced him, I think after two years or so, he's like, okay, I think you're smart enough to make some money and do this job. So um, that was <laughs> that was a revelation because I naively just thought I'd go off and be a concert organist or something. And um, and I remember being an uh, organist for him uh, for a summer at the First Presbyterian Church in New York City where he was organist. And um and he brought me in and he said, now, Mark, I want to share with you the real secret of what a church musician's life is, is really about. Like what makes being a church musician so uh, satisfying and meaningful. So I was, as a 20 year old, just ready to hear this wisdom of what he was going to say. And he says, it's the choir. Because it's all about the choir. And I just kind of looked at him and thought, really those old people that I have to deal with and those, those voices, you know, as a 20 year old, this is my, my thought. I was like, nah, there has to be something else. Uh, <laughs> now at 56, I'm thinking he's absolutely right. There is nothing uh, greater or more meaningful for a church musician than to be in community with uh, a group of people week by week uh, spiritually forming them as they form you, um, for a lifetime of service. And that, that group of course, is in turn, the worship leaders of the, of the assembly and, um, the choir, I mean, we know the, the ambiguous nature of a choir. It can be, uh, the most, uh, contentious place, but it also has the potential to be the spiritual, mm, power the kindling that happens that that really ushers in the spirit of of god because because through the music and the singing i think is how we get there so i love 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 making music with choirs um all all over the place i've been so lucky to um to experience the uh, helping enliven choir singing which enlivens the congregation and when i say choirs of course you know at, at hymn society mike that means the congregate you know the everybody who's there and that for me is a, is a really um that's definitely one of my agendas is to always make the congregation um it can't just be a, a, a group of people set apart it needs to be everybody um, you know i, I had a choir that used to say that, that the choir was church within a church and i guess it's also true to say then that it's also the choir within the choir huh yes yeah the choir within the choir that's that's good yeah yeah, yeah that's that's really cool now you, you you did go on to study more right uh, you went on juilliard i did i went to juilliard and studied with john weaver um that that robert baker retired while i was at yale so i studied also with charles kriegbaum who was an excellent teacher and um, all of them now, uh, to blessed memory, um, John Weaver, of course, uh, well-renowned, and, and he studied with Robert Baker. Um, and I remember Dr. Baker saying he came to me, and I didn't really have anything to teach him. Here's the guy <laughs> who plays every note perfectly, and uh, and 
but Dr. Baker also taught me that being a teacher is more of a coach anyway. Um, So that's been always words of wisdom for me in my uh, teaching career. But um, yes, two years at Juilliard were fantastic and also hard. Juilliard for me was a place that was kind of cold, competitive, um, and a little bit into conformity, like a factory. We're going to put you out. Not, I'm sure not everyone has that experience there, but, um, and it was also an interesting place for me because it, it, I mentioned earlier growing up, um, how I grew up actually in New, in New Jersey, where I lived was a majority white, um, majority as a 99.5% white (laughs) and having white parents. I never really understood what it was like to be in a black church or, uh, or any, any kind of diversity really in a church setting. So it wasn't until I was a grad student, I recent graduate student of Juilliard when I, uh, began working at a, at a Baptist church in Harlem, which is, uh, uh, of course, Black Baptist Church. And uh, that's where I had my (laughs) come to Jesus moment, if you will, about what it means to, um, well, I, who I am, uh, part of, part of who I am as, uh, you know, biracial identified Black uh, person in the United States growing up. That church experience was defining for me at age 24. Um, I often talk, tell this story to my students uh, where I was called on to play this little light of mine at the church. And um, I started playing from the hymnal. Um, I think that's the John Work arrangement. That's the only one that was in the hymnal. I'm going to let it shine. And the congregation was trying to sing uh, this little light of mine. And, uh, you know, the congregation was about 800 people at the moment. And I was playing on this large molar organ. And I, the minister, the, the pastor stopped me after a verse and said, Brother Mark, we know you've only been here a short time. What he really should have said is, Brother Mark, we know you have no clue what's going on and that your cultural context, uh, we assumed you knew something about black church, but you obviously don't. So, but he was very kind and said, you know, we do this in a more upbeat way. You probably know the the other way that we're trying to sing. So I started playing uh, just faster and um, it was disaster. Uh, they kept on singing the hymn they knew. But that was the moment that showed me I um, <laughs> I, I knew very little about church music outside of my own narrow box. And these years now, I can say that I, it was the beginning of my um, deconstructing of the the white supremacy of my church music teaching, which uh, which began in all walks of life by not uh, not exposing me or showing me that there are other performance practices I should learn, um, that there were other ways that people came to understand who God was through music other than European uh, classical music. So since that time, I felt uh, called to make sure I, I can create music that kind of in, is informed by uh, not only my upbringing of Western classical training, but African-American, uh, the African-American experience, the, the, the folk and jazz and rock and uh, blues that also form who I am. Um, and, and, and I feel that through the music, you know, certainly for me, like a, a healing began of understanding who I was and um, helping others understand what might be possible in singing about who we are and who God is. Wow. I I am so struck by the the story. I mean, so much um, of your music ministry has been formed by biography and by 
relationships. I, I mean, I, I mean, right from the beginning, I mean, you, your whole story, uh, you're, you're talking about how you've been formed in relation to various people and various circumstances that have, you know, called forth for you different things. Um, is, is, am, I, am I hearing you right? Absolutely. Yeah. No, I, um, for me, music making and music composing is always done in relationship in, in community. Uh, you know, I, I think about, uh, the songs that I, I write, uh, I never, I mean, it's very, very, very rarely ever write something and just put it aside. I write it thinking about the community that I'm worshiping with every Sunday or, or the community that I'm teaching, um, at one of the seminaries at Drew or the Div school at Yale. And I think about, what would this say to them? Does this connect? You know, because that's that's really um, it's really what it's about for me. And also, uh, over the years, I've learned that um, lyrics and and uh, words, I I love them, love them, but I'm not necessarily the one to write them. Um, sometimes I write them, but oftentimes I know the people that I get to collaborate with are so just incredibly gifted at writing them. Lori Zellman and Lindy Thompson and Adam Tice and John Thornburg and Jackie Jones. I mean, the, the list is Dave Bjorlin, who's a, a new great colleague and friend um, and collaborator. And I don't know, making music like that, creating it is just so much more fun. Um, and it, it also does something to, um, kind of pull the curtain back on this idea of the singular composer, you know, um, and, uh, I, I just don't think it's, that's true. Yeah. I mean, it sort of suggests that ministry is, is that it's fundamentally collaborative and fundamentally relational, uh, that you, you're not just creating out of nothing for nothing. Right. Uh, exactly. Yeah, that's really cool. You know, it's it's interesting. You, you talked about your background being mostly in organ performance, but I think you're certainly best known for your compositions. Uh, you know, people uh, know you through through the music you write. How, how did you get into uh, writing? Well, um, I started writing probably at an early age. Just the creative impulse. Uh, I. Uh, I started writing little songs in high school, uh, in college, I wrote some love songs cause I fell in love and, uh, mm. they're, <laughs> I laugh at them today because they're, they're sweet and naive. Um, but I did try to, I, I wrote a choral piece in college, which I thought was on uh, based on the Beatitudes. And I, I just knew it was a, a masterpiece and I had sent it to the, I'd gone for an interview, a meeting with the choral director of the Yale Glee Club. And he sat me down and I played for him and I was playing the piano like this and he was behind me. So at the very end of this long drawn out piece, oh my God, the poor man sat there for at least eight minutes. I turned around, you know, expecting the tears and, you know, I was ready to yeah, give him a tissue box and, <laughs> and very clear eyed. He said, I said, what did you think? And he goes, uh, that wasn't very good. And I said, well, is there a way to revise it? And he said, um, no, <laughs> he said, no, I wouldn't revise it. <laughs> oh boy. And, uh, but the one thing he did say to me as I was leaving sheepishly, uh, he said, you know, Mark, don't, don't stop. Don't stop composing, keep working at it. And, um, and at that point, I forgot. I, in high school, I had written an organ piece that was pretty good uh, on uh, called Fantasia for Pentecost. So um, it, it was written, actually, I, I played on an Allen electronic organ. And one of the keys wasn't, it, the contact was dusty. And it kept, like, skipping. And I was trying to get it working. And I just started... And this piece came uh, into being. So uh, it's kind of funny how uh, Dusty Contact made that yeah. piece work. But uh, thank you to Fenno Heath, who 
said, keep writing. He was absolutely right. That piece was just dreadful. I, I found it recently in a manuscript form and um, I wasn't like Duraflay or Brahms. I didn't burn it, but I, um, I will not let anyone see it. Um, so I just began writing, kept writing and it, my church job uh, in 1994 to, I wrote for them. Uh, I wrote a lot. I wrote Easter cantatas. I wrote anthems. I started getting commissioned. Now, mind you, everything from 92, 93, 94, 95, 96, I probably wrote 30, 40 pieces. Uh, none of them, maybe one or two of them, I would ever think that are, are any good. Most of them really just need to stay uh, on a dust heap. But in 1998 is kind of when I started consistently writing something that I would consider uh, worthwhile to share with people on a consistent basis. So, um, and it's weird to think now that's 25 years ago. No. Yeah. 1998. Yeah. 25. Oh boy. So um, yeah, to have been writing for that long, um, and I, and I, you know, I've never felt like, oh my gosh, am I going to run out of things to say, or is my music going to go stale or I've never had that feeling. I just always feel, um, so inspired when I, when I read a text, usually it's by reading a text that inspires me to write music. And, uh, I, I know maybe cause I know it's not for me. I definitely, uh, believe in the spirit working through me um, to help create something. So mm, my best pieces are when I can get out of the way mostly and let the spirit speak and the pieces that I feel don't work as well or aren't as true mm -hmm. um, probably have more of my involvement <laughs> in tinkering in them. Have you, have you ever written in the other direction? And the reason I'm asking is because uh, Mel Bringle was talking about how she writes, and she said she often likes to write her texts for tunes, and uh, rather than which I, I was like so surprised at. Like I can't wonder how many composers there are out there who write tunes looking for texts. So have you ever done that? Very rarely, very, very rarely, like maybe once or twice. And, you know, I did that because of another text writer asked me to do that. And that was Ruth Duck. Uh -huh. um, Ruth uh, had asked me, this is uh, you know, 15 or 16, or maybe even longer years ago, uh, 2003, it's 20 years ago, uh, to write some tunes and because i asked her if we could write a hymn together she goes sure can you write me some tunes <laughs> so, and they were somewhat successful i don't consider i i don't consider them actually that successful because my gift i feel is is having those those words first that's a great question though because um which means probably that mel and i won't get to write <laughs> won't yeah. get to collaborate much together because we we are looking for uh each other <laughs> who who's the chicken or the egg you know who's going to start what kind of goes to the collaborative nature of creating um songs for congregations to sing right uh, that that there are different aspects to that and you, it's just a question of who goes first right so. who goes first um the the times that i have written music before words it's almost like they come together at once and those are the times that i write the words myself like wow. christ has broken down the wall and that came together probably at the same time you know and um and i i've had a few pieces like that a piece called more love that was a commission and um a piece called beloved so yeah there there are those times when i have to when i'm writing down words and thinking of a text tune at the same time interesting you know you, you talked a lot about teachers who've had an influence on you but you've been teaching yourself now for quite a while um i wonder what the, how's that been for you wow that's a great question um well i i feel that i um <laughs> I don't know. I, I, by teaching myself, that's a great, great question. I, uh, I constantly look to others, uh, to see what they're doing. 
Um, in terms of composing, I guess finding my voice is, yeah, something I'm doing on my own musically. Um, in in relation to others, I mean, I'm always asking r- trusted colleagues, you know, does this sound like junk or is this okay, you know? And, and um, because I, yeah, discernment process I think is really important. Uh, testing my way forward, staying open to the spirit, the creativity. I, I want to, I always want to find more time to write. Uh, like I need to find more time to write organ rep. I feel like I have a lot to contribute there. And, um, uh, but I'm also realizing that, you know, I'm, a, I'm pretty, I'm rather prolific, even having eight jobs, you know, I'll, I'll you know, still finding the time all of a sudden the time becomes very meaningful when you don't have much of it. And in those kind of secret hours or moments that you say, I don't have time for this, but something's speaking to me and it just, you make time. So so maybe I shouldn't retire from all of my jobs, but uh, (laughs) some of them soon, hopefully. (laughs) So you, sp- speaking of your jobs, I mean, you're a professor and you have students, too. So um, h- how do you um, what, what, what kinds of things are you thinking about uh, in, as you sort of work with uh, people who are now being formed themselves? Mm. Well, I, I love how I get to teach in um, institutions that aren't conservatories or aren't focused on, you know, the music, the way I teach music at Drew is basically to help form uh, ordained people to know the values and the meaning in worship and to work with a person who will also collaborate with them in relationship. So, um, so in many ways, I'm not teaching people who are solely musicians i'm teaching people who are going to get up and lead the congregation or work with musicians um at yale it's a little different yale i do teach church musicians and um and i'm i'm really i the organists who are coming to yale to the institute of sacred music um i get the privilege of teaching them every semester uh in the fall in the fall semester uh a course that I co-teach with Walden Moore, fantastic church musician, who um, I, I try to teach him to play off the page. And the experience that I had with this little light of mine, I, I begin there and say, you know, you're going to learn how to play with your ears, close the book, um, and learn a performance practice that might seem foreign to you. But, um, you know, we're going to learn Siahamba on the pipe organ and how to make that come alive or um, you're going to learn how to play uh, Jackson Five. Uh, uh, I want you back before the, the song "All My Days" begins. So, um, and over the years, I've been encouraged because the organists keep becoming more and more open, and 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 are ready to receive that, and are already uh, quite accomplished in um, in things that I didn't know much about when I was when I was their age. So, uh, yeah. So mainly I get to be a joy, uh, try to open up and give joy to a lot of people at seminary to remind them what, what, what worship really should do the deep joy, the deep sorrow that that's really, um, what we need to touch on in our, in our worship life through music. I wonder if we could talk about the hymn society a little bit. Um, you, you, the, I, I know you from the hymn society and, you know, the uh, certainly members there certainly know you and respect you. And I wonder, um, you know, how you got involved and uh, what, what kinds of experiences you've had there. Yeah. Well, what can I say? I mean, yeah, the hymn society is kind of for people like us, it's, <laughs> uh, you know, walking into, um, I don't know, some kind of Nirvana-esque Shangri-La uh, <laughs> for the annual conferences, you know. Um, and I first, but when I first went, which might have been about 20 years ago, I got invited to to hear um, 
someone uh, maybe invited to go play for something in 2000 four or five maybe it wasn't quite 20 years 2008 uh it was out in um uh in san francisco i remember that in oakland area and and probably my first thought was like wow you know it's a lot of old people <laughs> <laughs> a lot of old white people and uh and i made myself uh at all reflected in in that group uh and when I think about that and I think about 2023, I think about, I mean, yes, we are still a majority of a specific age and, and cultural background, but I also see us coming, come a really long way of being intentional about where we want to see ourselves. So, um, so even, but even back in those days of, uh, you know, what am I doing here? I really was captivated by these people singing their hearts out. And I thought, you know, maybe these are my people because, you know, they are singing their hearts out. And, and I believe, I believe in that. <laughs> I believe in that practice of, um, of singing these, you know, theologically, morally imaginative words to, to just incredible um, tunes and music. And I want to be a part of helping create what you all are singing. So um, that, yeah, that, but then probably about 10 years ago was my, you know, I'm all in, I drank the Kool-Aid and I'm ready to be, uh, you know, <laughs> ready for my casket to be pushed down during a hymn society annual conference singing, uh <laughs> Thing, uh, draw the circle wide or something you know well, that would be amazing not that i'm in a rush to get there to that <laughs> <laughs> yeah. promise to do it for you mike for sure. <laughs> thank you <laughs> i'm closer to it than you are <laughs> uh, no, that would be awesome well wow. so uh, i guess um I, I was wondering about also your your role in the United Methodist Church, you're talking about uh, so many of your influences were Methodist. And, um, uh, you know, it's been, I know it's been a hard time in the United Methodist Church. And I wonder how you see the role of singing and music in, uh, in the church moving forward. Yeah, that's a, it's a great question. I mean, uh, we, yeah, we are at the point where um, we where we were in 1844, um, in some ways where we were in 1939. Um, and in the place of crisis, of course, comes the chances for opportunity and reimagining something new. Uh, yeah, I've, I've been in this struggle to see a more welcoming, inclusive Methodist church for, uh, well over a couple of decades now. And, Music, of course, has always been the way to um, creatively protest where we see, you know, we need to speak truth to power. And um, it's always been, we, you know, so people in the LGBT community, LGBTQ uh, community and, and those who ally themselves know that we stand on the shoulders of others, you know, who've gone before in uh, the movement of, uh, social protest to um by singing uh in south africa against apartheid in um in estonia i mean in in uh, yeah estonia the singing revolution in our own country civil rights um period in uh, i i mean i think also about black lives matter and some of the lack of of singing uh at times that that I think we need to kind of recapture. But anyway, Methodism has always been a singing movement. Of course, Charles Wesley uh, wrote the words and uh, they found some tunes and um, people's hearts were moved. And because, because of our roots in that singing uh, revolution, I think uh, singing will play a very key role coming on in the future. And, um, you know, I'm humbled to know that my music plays a part in the reshaping, you know, the dream of the new church that's coming to be. And, um, you know, we just need to continue 
<laughs> composing, singing, writing uh, songs that show just how welcoming God's love is and the impetus on us to um, to create the world, to help create the world that God is dreaming for us. Um, so very much in the uh, very much in the path of the social gospel movement. Uh, I just said to music or we just sang it on our, our on Sunday, Frank Mason North's uh, we're across the crowded ways of life. Right. Which he wrote, you know, in the early 20th century, that's I'm firmly in that tradition and want to continue to help usher in the kingdom of God, you know, here and now with the music. So I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm an optimist by nature. So I'm, I'm hopeful for our church and, um, and know that, you know, music and worship will play central role. Well, I have just one more question, uh, unless there's something else I didn't ask that you would, you would want, me, want to talk about, but, uh, and that would be about the, again, going back to the hymn society and, uh, the future, uh, you talked about how it's come. So what would be your fondest hope for the hymn society going forward? Mm. Well, I, I, yeah, I say the path that it's on is a good one. Um, more just continue to become a more intergenerational, a more intercultural, interracial meeting place. Um, I, and I guess I'm talking to myself as well now that I'm, you know, uh, approaching one of the elders that uh, I need to make sure I'm making room for other voices to be heard and, and other people's song to be sung um, and, and not judging what that experience might be for me. Um, you know, of course, I'll hold on to some of the great traditions that I feel um, are most vital to us, but I, I need to make more room as well uh, so that other voices can be heard. And, um, and hopefully it's never a, um, you know, pushing something aside to, uh, but, it's, but it's including, you know, so it's saying uh, we'll do this and this not that or that. So I'm trying not to work out of a scarcity principle, but then the hymn society realizes that there is this amazing abundance of, um, of work. So, and it's hard for me because I look at all the hymn, the hymnals be beside behind you, Mike. Yeah. And, you know, those are, that's how I operate, but realizing that the next generation, you know, is not necessarily singing out of that, those hymnals. And, um, and eagerly inviting and and perhaps even going out of our <laughs> of our normal um way of doing things to to really see where god's leading next i yeah it's hard it's hard to being comfortable is where we're at but somebody made room for me so i'll you know that's true and you you've, uh, you know you told a couple of stories that sort of um, model what it's like to uh, to, to have an, a realization that something needs to change, you know, and, and I, I think that's a, that's a good good model for all of us to, to listen to. I mean, you are such a treasure and, uh, you know, as a leader, as a creator, um, just by being, by being who you are, you, you really inspire us all. And I'm grateful for that. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Um, so um, I think I think that's it for today. I, I really am so grateful to, uh, that you were here with us today, and uh, thank you, Mark. Take care. Take care. Bye bye.